I open that. I am ready. Yeah, um, it's it's in the internet. Idarəçlik formu. Internet idarəçlik formu müxtəlif tərəfdaşları bərabərlik əsasında bir araya gətirərək internet ilə bağlı vacib ictimai siyasi məsələləri müzakirəsinə xidmət edir. Azərbaycanda internet azadlığı təmin olunmuş. İnternet azadlığı təmin olunmuş Azərbaycanda da bu müzakirələrlə bağlı bu müzakirələr internet azadlığı təmin olunmuş Azərbaycanda da həm dövlət, həm də qeyri-dövlət sektoru üçün vacib informasiya mənbəyi hesab edilir. Bu müzakirələr internet azadlığı təmin olunmuş Azərbaycanda da həm dövlət, həm də qeyri-dövlət sektoru üçün vacib informasiya mənbəyi hesab edilir. I'm ready and you, my friend. Başlayaq mı? Başka bilir miyiz? Demek ki, internet idarəçilik formu, hala böyle özüm için deyirəm də, internet idarəçilik formu müxtəlif tərəfdaşları bir araya getirərək internet ilə bağlı vazib məsələlərinin müzakirəsində xidmət edir. Bu müzakirələr internet azadlığı təmin olunmuş Azərbaycanda da həm dövlət, həm də qeyri dövlət sektoru üçün vazib informasiya mənbəyi rolunu oynayır. Vazib informasiya mənbəyi hesab edilir. Həm dövlət. İnformasiya mənbəyi hesab edilə bilər. İnternet idarəçilik formu, internet idarəçilik formu müxtəlif tərəfdaşları bərabərlik əsasında bir araya gətirərək internetə bağlı vacib ictimai siyasi məsələlərini müzakirə edilir. Axırda deyim mən ki, bəlkə qutarın konsultasını deyim belə, beləliklə internet idarəçilik formu Sən də şeyin axırında, sücətin axırında. Cəmaatda gəhsin də, eləmi. Ələskər Vəlim İlqar Abdullayev carçı. Beləliklə, internet idarəçilik formu müxtəlif tərəfdaşları bir araya gətirərək hesab edilir. Qulaq, qoy cəmaat, söz deyirəm sənə. Bəlkə, belə eləyəsən. Qulaq, az mənə. Arxası belə cəmaat olsun. Niyə? Ya da belə. E, bir o da axırda beləliklə uşu cəmaat da alışır və formuna axırır. Bu müzakirələr internet azadlığı təmin olunmuş Azərbaycanda da həm dövlət, həm də qeyri dövlət sektoru üçün həm dövlət, həm də qeyri dövlət sektoru üçün informasiya mənbəyi hesab edilə bilər. Carçı, Ərəskər Vəlib İlqar Abdullayev Carçı.
verdi uşaqlara. Bağlı açmış. Bir dən verdi uşaqlara. That's on. And then... Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Ah. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We're about to start the emerging issues section. I would all request you to use your headphones, please, because that's the only way we can hear each other. We have to use our headphones. Uh, that's the only way we can hear each other, by using the headphones. You have to get the headphones from there, please. Okay, I'll now hand over the session to Mr. Philip Vivier, who is going to be the chairman of the session. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's my great pleasure to open this first main session of the 2012 Internet Governance Forum. Welcome to Azerbaijan and welcome to the IGF. For the next three hours, we'll be discussing a number of emerging issues focusing on various aspects of the free flow of information. We'll be guided through the session by three moderators, Ms. Anna Neves of the Government of Portugal, Mr. Izumi Aizu of Tama University in Japan, and Mr. Thomas Spiller, Vice President of the Walt Disney Company. Our moderator for remote participation 
is Ms. Valeria Betancourt from the Association of Progressive Communications. There will be four parts to the session, each discussing uh, different topics. First, the role of information and communications technology in disaster relief and mitigation and the possible policy frameworks to enable collaboration. Second, the core issue of this session, the free flow of information and internet governance and human rights. Third, protection of intellectual property online and the appropriate and proportionate measures for protection while maintaining the ability and rights for people to share cultural assets and content and to be able to innovate and create. And fourth, the opportunities and challenges arising as traditional media are increasingly accessed over the internet. For example, new models for accessing content, user-generated content, and so forth. So I will now pass over to our moderators for the session, Anna Neves, Thomas Biller, and Azumi Ezu. And Valeria Betancourt will bring comments from our remote participants. Thank you very much, Ambassador Babir. Um, and we are really glad to see that our session around emerging issues are now beginning. And as Ambassador told us, there are four parts, but um, we are largely breaking this into two different parts. The first part deals with the role of the internet and ICT and the traditional media for disaster recovery or disaster management. We'll spend first 45 minutes uh, on this subject. And then we combine the question two, three, and four and make it one sort of large section under the theme of free flow of information, freedom of expression, human rights, balance with intellectual property rights, and possibly some other dimensions. Um, I'd like to just briefly introduce our excellent speakers here. Um, from, I can't see that far, from very far, uh, ladies first, um, Ms. Sabine, Sabine Belhayen, am I right? She is a member of European Parliament. And then next to her is Mr. Ko Fuji. Um, he is the Google Japan um, policy counselor. And then next to him is Mr. Valens Riadi. He is the head of Eaputi Foundation and also APGI, the Indonesian um, ISP's association um, from Indonesia. And then um, we have Mr. Chengata and uh, the Chairman um, Ambassador Bavier, and then we have Mr. Patrick Ryan. He's the Policy Council Open Internet at Google. Um, we are expecting Mr. Scott Seitz um, to take the floor, but somehow we haven't been able to bring him up onto the stage. If you know where he is, please ask him to join. Um, then last but not least, Mr. Giacomo Mazzone, he is the head of Institutional Relations and Members Relations South European Broadcasting Union, or EBU. Um, without further ado, I'd like to go into the first, oops, first session. So there will be some video to show you. It was the largest Earth history.
dead or missing, and destroying thousand homes. Thousands lost family members, their jobs, and their livelihoods. Now I'd like to introduce um, my uh, government, um, Japanese government, Mr. Toru Nakaya, the Director General, Institute for International Communication Policy, um, to say a few words only about this disaster. Mr. Nakaya, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Aizu, for your kind introduction. Uh, my name is Toru Nakaya uh, from Japanese government. Uh, as you see on the video, on 11th of March 2011, uh, the earthquake of magnitude 9.0 hit the northeastern coast of Japanese mainland. About half an hour later, the giant tsunami arrived at the coast of the area. Uh, as, as it was announced, uh, approximately 20,000 lives were lost. In the aftermath of this disaster, Japan received assistance from many countries. Uh, in total, 163 countries or region and 43 international organizations. Uh, on behalf of the government of Japan, I express my sincere gratitude, gratitude to those countries and regions who extended assistance to Japanese people and victims. As you may easily anticipate, the telecom infrastructure in the devastated area was severely affected. Firstly, by congestion, because many people want to check if their friends are safe or not. And secondly, by physical damage, either by earthquake itself or tsunami. And thirdly, by blackout. That means loss of electricity supply. ICT doesn't work without electricity supply. And tsunami washed away everything, including mobile communication stations. So it's really, really difficult to communicate each other in the devastated areas. On the other hand, uh, in the outside of the devastated areas, uh, people tried to save or assist those victims, making use of ICTs. And some went very well, but some didn't. And we, I mean, Japanese, learned a lot from this disaster. And I believe it will be the same for the panelists sitting here on the stage. And they have something to talk to you so that you can learn something and use it for the future disaster. So I sincerely hope that this first session is really useful for you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Nakaya-san. Now we'd like to have um, two speakers. Um, first one is Mr. Ko Fuji um, from Google Japan. Uh, Mr. Fuji will elaborate their um, crisis responses, not only confined in Japan, but touching upon other global crises um, and how the ICTs or their services are used or utilized or not. Um, Mr. Fuji, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Naka. Thank you, Mr. Aizu. So just please give me a moment until I uh, put up my slides. Okay, um, so uh, thank you for giving this, me this opportunity to uh, speak about the role of internet for disaster reduction. Um, so this was a very difficult uh, times for us uh, in Google Japan. I was uh, I was there in Japan when the disaster struck, and uh, we went through this operation of uh, several months of disaster uh, relief as well as um, disaster uh, rebuilding the economy. Um, so I'd like to first tell a little bit about the history of Google's disaster response. Um, so when disaster strikes, people turn to the internet for information. Technology first helps first responders save lives. So technology doesn't save lives per se, but it helps the first responders save lives. And uh, so you didn't hear about uh, 
the role of internet in disaster relief until about 10 years ago. But um, in Google, it all started in 2005 when people spontaneously started using Google Earth as a clearinghouse for information and idea sharing. Um, this was a very good platform because you can visualize this lot of data and people can exchange ideas on the map. And uh, then during 2010, during the Haiti earthquake, um, Google developed the Person Finder. So this is a uh, registry for missing persons. Um, as you can see on the green, it says, I'm looking for someone. And on the blue, on the right, it says, I have information about someone. So people can exchange information about their loved ones, people they are looking for um, through this platform. Um, and after Hurricane Katrina, a lot of websites created registries, uh, person registries. But the idea of Google Person Finder was to create a uh, common data format. Um, so we could sh centralize and accept data for, from different registries. So these registries do not get fragmented. That was the whole purpose of Person Finder. And uh, Haiti was another watershed moment for us um, because we saw that maps could be combined with other disaster relief tools. So uh, this is actually the aerial image of Port-au-Prince um, in 2009, and this is what you see after the disaster. And responders use maps to plan and choose medical evacuations uh, locations. So this was a very uh, it proved to be a very useful tool. And then what Google ended up doing was that uh, we uh, created a disaster response, crisis response team, explicitly dedicated to disaster relief. And since then, we've respons to, responded to about uh, 28 um, disaster cases, including most recently Hurricane Sandy, um, which is uh, late um, last month. So um, now I'm going to talk about the uh, Great East Japan earthquake of March 11th, 2012. Obviously, this is not just an earthquake. It also involved tsunami as well as the, uh, the nuclear disaster. So it was a triple disaster. Um, this was actually uh, uh, a picture taken from our office. You could see the smokes um, by the horizon. It's actually an oil refinery by Tokyo um, blowing up in the sky. So uh, it was a really scary moment, about um, 2, 2.30, 2.46 in the afternoon. Um, but because we had been preparing for these crisis response as a team, we were able to put up the person finder in less than two hours. So uh, we were able to put up the person finder at about 4.30. And uh, within an hour after putting up the person finder, we were able to uh, establish the, uh, the crisis response portal site, uh, which um, after this moment helped many people uh, go through these difficult times by providing various information. Now I'm going to talk about um, the Google Japan's operation, not in a chronological order, but I'm going to pick up different themes um, so that we can flow uh, directly into the next part of the discussion, which is the various um, emerging issues, such as issues having to do with mobile devices, connectivity, social media, and our relationship with traditional media. So the first thing that we did was we aggregated and visualized data from public sources. This is like the ABC of crisis response. This is the first thing that you would do. You would visualize data from public sources, usually on maps. So this is the, um, the data of drivable roads. Um, we got these data from probe data. Um, Honda originally provided these data. Uh, after that, we got the, uh, the similar data from the uh, the ITS uh, Society of Japan, which is a uh, pu publicly affiliated organization. So um, drivable roads are important um, to know which, dry, which roads can be driven for, for uh, disaster relief purposes. Um, similar map, planned power outage map. Um, because of the nuclear disaster, power was out. We had a rolling uh, power outage. Um, and you know different blocks of, uh, of the city were um, went through power outage at different times and people wanted to know the plans. So we got this data from the electric, uh, electricity company through the cooperation of Ministry of Economy and Trade um, and we created these maps. Um, similarly, we are creating the lifeline map. Um, these are uh, mobile availability, gas um, and other data aggregated into one format. So um, what is important about this operation? Access to data and open government. We talk about open government um, a lot recently, but this is really crucial in times of uh, disaster. 
And um, uniform standards and machine readable format are, very, are, are also key. Because um, in a lot of cases in Japan, the government provided the data in PDF, or they would just have the, the um, information in hard copies, which are not useful or not readily uh, usable. And uh, so, so it is, um, this, this was actually a lesson learned. Machine readable format is very important. Now, collaboration with traditional media. Um, something really phenomenal happened. Um, so uh, this is actually the news of TBS. TBS is a, a, a big t t television broadcasting station in Japan. Immediately after the earthquake, they started broadcasting uh, TV news on the internet through YouTube. This is not something that would happen normally because, you know, at normal times we would have to go through loads of um, copyright restrictions and business transactions and contracts to make this happen. But in a, in a, in a crisis situation, uh, internet companies and broadcasting companies really cooperated to make this happen. Same with uh, YouTube person search channel. People were searching for people and TV broadcasters interviewed and we put them up on the YouTube immediately. And we also did TV, TV advertising. Um, this may sound odd, but TV can really reach a lot of people. And a lot of people don't know what, what um, information is out there on the web. So we actually ran TV as to show that um, what information you can find on internet portal sites that are um, responding to crises. And the uh, same thing, uh, we had information up on mobile. And then the next week, uh, we did newspaper ads to tell people that you can find this information on mobile. Infrastructure, connective connectivity, data traffic, and devices. These were um, the physical layer of the internet, but these were also very important. Um, for example, devices. Um, you know, people didn't have PCs, and PCs they didn't have connectivity because the, their devices were washed away and cables were, um, you know, cut. Um, and the only devices that people could rely on most of the time were the mobile phones in their pockets. So we uh, enabled Person Finder for mobile. Uh, we also enabled Crisis Portal site for mobile. Um, and so uh, devices, the choice of devices uh, also play a crucial role when you're responding to, to disasters. And uh, this is also an infrastructural problem. Uh, so government websites and public utilities websites started going down because there was so much traffic going there and they, they could not just hold up the concentration of, of, of, uh, of traffic. So uh, the government and internet companies such as Google, Yahoo, and other companies um, collaborated to mirror government and public utilities websites so that vital information is always up there on the web. Um, another uh, issue that was really interesting for us, us was digitizing real-world information. Um, so when we talk about the internet, you sort of assume that the information is already up there on the web and it's just a matter of how to collaborate and, um, uh, and curate those information. But in, in a crisis situation, especially in, terms of in, in times of natural disaster, a lot of the information is actually in the real world. It's not even on the web. It's not digitized. So how do you do it? This was an interesting case. Um, so this was online sharing of refugee roasters in shelters. What happened was that, um, so we had the person finders and those who had digital access to the internet were able to use person finders. But it, in, in, the, in the core regions of the disaster, people only had pencils and papers and markers. So what they would do is they would scribble their names on these pieces of papers and post them up on the, on the walls of the hospitals and the shelters, um, you know, hopefully, hope, hoping that you know, somebody will find, find out that they are alive. But somebody started tweeting that, you know, if this information are, are, are there on, on the walls, why not take pictures of them? And, you know, if you have a, a, a web-enabled uh, digital phone, then, then you can put it up on the web. So volunteers started uh, taking pictures of these um, lists of names. They put them up on the web. And volunteers from all over the world who could read Japanese um, actually started uh, entering this information onto Person Finder. So uh, we had about uh, 5,000 uh, volunteers uh, in a matter of a few days um, that entered uh, about 140,000 names onto the web. So this was a real case of online-offline collaboration. Um, health and hygiene map. 
this information had to be collected by, uh, uh, by foot, by nurses and doctors. Um, and then once they were collected, we were able to digitize them. But the next time, you know, uh, hopefully we will have um, devices, mobile devices that will enable doctors and nurses to be able to collect this information more easily. Satellite images and aerial images, these were also real uh, world information that needed to be put up on the web. Um, and these are actually, you know, um, costly and heavy operation. But when the government will not do it, you have to do it yourself. Um, we also ran Street View Digital Archive Project. Um, this is also a powerful tool. For example, um, this is the, uh, the, the, uh, the scenery before the uh, earthquake, and this is after the earthquake. Y you can just see that the whole rows of houses are, are just gone on the left side. So these are also powerful too. And uh, so not, uh, in, in these slides, in the next few slides, I want to talk about the, the different phases we go through in crisis response. I said in the beginning of this slide that um, technology helps first responders respond. After the first responders, we get into a phase where we, the technology can help the survivors survive on their own. We provide them information about where they can get food, shelter, or where they can take a bath, where are the toilets, where can they store garbage, things like that. And then after that phase, in the third phase, we really start helping communities rebuild. Um, that is rebuilding the business economically, socially, and also culturally. So what we did after uh, a month and a half after the earthquake is that we put up Business Finder. This is not Person Finder, it's Business Finder. Um, a lot of uh, factories were gone and shops were gone, but people throughout Japan and uh, you know, across the world wanted to know where, where their suppliers were, if their clients were okay. So we put up a Business Finder to enable business to know, uh, to reconnect again with their business partners. YouTube business support channel. This was also a, a collaboration between web and business, trying to help the community rebuild. Um, so uh, that I'm getting close to the end of my story. I only have two more slides. But um, what what are we going to do for the future? So uh, Google, Twitter, and other uh, web companies. We discussed and we decided to do a big project called Project 311. It's a big data workshop, a postmortem for the future. So what we did was, um, we wanted to know what we did right and what we did not right, uh, what we did wrong, and uh, we wanted to know how we can improve in the next disaster. So what we did was, since we don't have a time machine, we can go back into the past, but we can replicate the flow of information um, from March 11th. So uh, we gathered information from various partners: one week of newspaper articles, text of TV coverage, one week of entire tweets. Travel, roads information, uh, people location information, railroad operation information, and uh, we did a, a series of. We actually had a, f a series of 50 workshops, um, various um, data scientists um, trying to analyze and simulate these data. This is actually a media coverage map. Um, the uh, the red is where the traditional media was able to cover um, the the reporting, and the the yellow is where we saw a concentration of tweets. And as you can see, the, the traditional media does not necessarily correspond to the, uh, the location of where the tweets were happening. So uh, these are powerful tools that, that can give lessons to the traditional media where reporters and correspondents should go in the next disaster. This is another example, overlaying data from various resources. The green is real-time population based on GPS-enabled mobile phone data, and the red is government's radiation detector network system. So um, you can see how people were exposed to radiation. Um, this, is a, uh, this is a still uh, picture, but it actually moves. Um, you have a time slider on, on this slide, so it's, it's really neat to, to watch. So um, this is the end of my slide. So record, share, and simulate, and build new tools for the future. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Fuji. Um, it, is, it is not what Google did, but what the larger community, Yahoo or many other, it's something like 300 different websites came up within a week or two to help the victims or share the information about radiation or about electric power stop and other uh, crises. <coughs> Now I'd like to introduce our second speaker, and then if you have any questions, we'll hear from the floor after our second speaker finishes his presentation. Mr. Riyadi, 
He's from uh, Indonesia. He worked right after the Aceh tsunami, flew with the military airplane and helped build the Wi-Fi centers. But that's 2004. Since then, they have started for the preparation or uh, relief works using ICTs for any other large-scale disasters in Indonesia, including volcano eruption and so on and so forth. Mr. Riyadi, you have the floor. Okay, thank you, Izumi. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity that uh, I can share our experience uh, when we face several disasters in Indonesia. Maybe a uh, previous pre presentation talk about the, how the big corporate uh, do something for the disaster but what I want to share here is more from the civil society how we can do hand in hand together to do something for the disaster relief okay uh, right now I work for the Indonesia ISP Association and also uh, I'm a volunteer for the Air Putih Foundation we create this foundation specially for disaster uh, relief management. There will be uh, several example how we do on the disaster area, but uh, that's not all of uh, my project. This is also to honor, to acknowledge uh, several other friends that do almost the same things. Okay. I will start from the 2004 where we got uh, hit by the tsunami, especially in the Aceh area and also several area on the North Sumatra. It's a quite big uh, earthquake, it's 9.1 Richter and the tsunami go more than 30 meters high on some area. Yeah. After the tsunami hit, uh, most of the people in Indonesia didn't know what really happened on the disaster area. We lost contact to the area when some friends have a family there and they don't know what's really happened there until after several days after we sent several uh, airline to do a site survey we know that the condition is really bad and ABG, that time the ISP association, we, we think that if we send like uh, food or blanket or some others uh, needs, maybe some other body already done it. But uh, we think that uh, we are on uh, IT association. I think it's much be, uh, it will be better if we send some engineers uh, to the disaster area and we will help on the IT uh, programs. And uh, at that time we sent six people and I'm one of the six people who flew to the area just uh, three days and five days after the tsunami. And of course we, we still have, we still see all of the terrible things there, dead body everywhere and everything. And uh, after that we established the foundation because we got some donation from big corporation for example from Intel they give us uh, several laptops and also the WiMAX uh, network and we create also a website Aceh Media Center and it's a uh, information about uh, what really happened in the area so the journalists from everywhere can understand what really happened there and we also make a uh, short code uh, SMS and uh, people in the area and also people outside the area can uh, communicate each other. I think this is a traditional version of the people finder that we have seen in the previous presentation. And then uh, after that we also create a early warning system application and this application connected through uh, connected to the meteorology system where we got the information about uh, earthquake it will analyze the information and if we have a tsunami warning it will go to the television and also a radio station so uh, the television can have uh, initiate information if the government think that it, it will be a tsunami warning this is a uh, several photo from the area we make uh, 
public computer, public access internet, and also we have to clean up several satellite dish to create uh, internet access there. And uh, this is the the plan we make for the Banda Aceh. It's the capital city of Aceh. We make a very nice wireless network and uh, we, we, we deploy three access point and also uh, 50 CPE with the WiMAX technology. It's maybe right now WiMAX technology is not very uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. At the time, the WebEx technology is one of the new technology we have to deliver the, the internet. Okay, this is uh, several photo when we deploy the access point. And also, this is the photo when we deploy the CPE. It's quite a nice photo. Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, that's, it's a disaster area. You cannot uh, hope that you will got an ideal condition to, to work with. We make also several media centers and several other things. Also, of course, uh, community development. Yeah. No. Okay, uh, speak closer to the microphone, maybe so that you can also. Okay. Um, the the program we do in Aceh is not stop there. There are still several disaster after Aceh. We works at Nias, uh, Wasior, Padang, and several other disaster area. Okay, uh, I will move to the next uh, disaster. This is also my personal experience here about the Bengkulu. We have a earthquake. It's not that big, but uh, several area hit by the earthquake. And the mission is that the national government needs to establish a special task force to do the verification of the victim data of the earthquake at Bengkulu area and the challenge is that uh, we only have 20 hours of preparation time and time build up and uh, only two weeks of time frame the area is quite uh, big with the low density of population and for this uh, project uh, the government asked me to work together with uh, Indonesia Special Force Kopassus. I, the team is only 20 people, uh, two IT people and uh, 18 uh, people from the army. Yeah, this is uh, several photo how how we go to the area. It's not uh, near from Jakarta. It's quite far. If we drive, it takes two days. That's why we use a plane to. Uh, move the car and all the uh, equipments. Yeah, that's the that's the photo from. Okay, uh, the last the last ex the last disaster experience I will I want to share is uh, from Yogyakarta. It's from the October until November 2010. We have a volcano. The volcano is located only 30 kilometers from Yogyakarta city. Yogyakarta is a, it's not a very big city. Only 3 million people live there. And the, the volcano located uh, only 30 kilometers. And it's an active volcano. Yeah. After the, there are several eruptions happen that year and 
after the first eruption on October 26, almost uh, 50,000 people from the 10 kilometers radius evacuated by the government. You can imagine uh, we have to make all the settlement for 50,000 people. And we have also a real-time live report using communication radio. It's a 149 megahertz. And it's also relate to several internet-based radio streaming. So people from everywhere in the world, they can uh, hear what happened really on the area. And then uh, we have second eruption on November 4th. It's uh, really on the 1 a.m. at the night. And the government extend to uh, evacuated area to 20 kilometers, and from 50,000 people it goes to 100,000 people. You can imagine uh, we already have 50,000, and after the government uh, extend the evacuated area, it goes to 100,000, and it's uh, in 1 a.m. in the morning. And uh, the ABG, the association, we deploy. Several Wi-Fi area on the government building, refugee camp, and also, but uh, half of the Wi-Fi area is swept by the second eruption. And then uh, we think how we can uh, reach the people in the refugee camp. They don't have internet, they don't have electricity, so uh, we initiate to build the FM radio station. Of course, this is not very high tech, but. Uh, It needs more collaboration with several others' body. The government, the Directorate General Post and Telecommunication, assign a temporary allocation, 100.2 FM, and we can uh, build our radio station. This program supported by a lot of uh, association and body. Uh, I will, uh, RRI is the National Radio of Indonesia, also support us. We have also several RRI others association. National Radio of Indonesia also support us. We have also several RRI others association. Radio of Indonesia also support us. We have also several RRI others association. Radio of Indonesia also support us. We have also several others. It's like an emergency. <laughs> Are you ready? It's like an emergency. <laughs> Check. Okay, and uh, this radio station we we make it uh, online, not online. It, we make it uh, on air, 24 hours a day for 30 days on the eruption. It's operated by almost 60 volunteers, including the announcer, scriptwriter, IT support, and others uh, function. And also we do a live streaming for this radio on the that website. This is uh, several photos from the radio station. And uh, we have also several others uh, civil society programs that we help. Have also several others uh, civil society pro. Check, yeah. We have also several other society uh, program that help the people near the eruption area. One is the Jalin Merapi website. The near the eruption area. What? Yeah. This is the website, and this website uh, have a lot of information about the area. Have uh, CCTV. They put a several CCTV on the website so you can see the real what happened on the area, real time. Yeah, and also they have a feeding from the Twitter so people can exchange information related with this disaster on Twitter and also displayed on this website. Yeah. And I will, I want to review several other disaster in Indonesia. Indonesia have a lot of disasters in the several. Last years, and in 
2010, we have approximately 644 disasters, small until big disaster. And most of the disaster is about a hydrometeorology disaster. It's about water and also a volcano. And uh, from my experience, what uh, IT can take position on the disaster relief is uh, three things. One is the communication, information dissemination, and also a disaster management. The most important thing is the communication. Once the disaster happens, sometimes uh, all the communication uh, broke and people cannot call, people cannot do text, people cannot access the internet. That's why we have to able to make a very fast uh, internet access with the special mobile telecommunication unit and several other special equipment. For example, if we have a telephone line and solar broken, we can deploy a voice over IP and make a termination to the telephone network. And also, uh, one of the friends in Indonesia learned about the Open BTS. We can also uh, deploy Open BTS to make a special and small uh, GSM network on the disaster area. It's very useful when you don't have any other infrastructure. And also, uh, social network like Twitter, Facebook, YouTube can take a important position to give uh, opportunity for the people to communicate each other. Of course, about the information dissemination, this is to the people in the disaster area. Sometimes government needs to tell something to the people in the disaster area. And also, we, we need to bring the information from the disaster area to other, to, to the world. So, for example, if some other country can help or some other uh, body can help to do the disaster relief. And also the disaster management, it's about a coordination, data collection, relief supplies, missing person, humanity program, and other things. Okay, uh, this is, maybe if uh, this slide can download somewhere, I, I don't know, but you can see the diagram we make to, for the special car, special mobile telecommunication unit. I think it's too small for you to see, but... Uh, in Indonesia right now, we have uh, the government use the USO funded program for the internet and information dissemination at the remote area. Right now we have 2,600 mobile units. The photo is uh, like this. It's already deployed on uh, almost all area of Indonesia. As long as you can have a road, I think the uh, right now we have this uh, type of the unit. So when, if we have like a disaster, it's quite easy for the government to create a new internet access on the disaster area. And also the, this is quite similar units from the civil society. Yeah. We, several uh, NGO in Indonesia have this type of car, almost the same with the VSAT, with the internet access, laptop and everything. And this car also have a 4x4 capability, so it can go to more a remote area. Yeah, this is uh, almost the same car, but but from the operator. Yeah. Okay, I think that's all my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valens. Uh, despite all the noise and uh, interesting echoes, um, your really activities or actions stand out. Uh, how many countries in this globe have 2,600 mobile units ready for the disaster communications? There were almost none in Japan about two years ago. So with that, I'd like to, if you have any questions or short comments, um, please take my, the floor, I mean the microphones. Um, I'm just trying to find the well, remote um, participation if they have any comments. But so far, I don't think there is. Is there any brave guy? Um, if not, then I will use my moderate. Jacob, you have one? Okay, please. Uh, yes, I have two questions. One is, uh, um, 
about this experience are related with the um, uh, organized um, uh, forum for exchange of uh, information about um, intervening in emergency for communication. There is one coordination within the ITU and there is another one within the UNESCO. There is any relation between this experience that we have uh, listened now. And the second is uh, what about the cooperation with the broadcasting? I have seen that in Indonesia this was mentioned as an essential part. Uh, in Japan, what about? Thank you. The first question is in relation with ITU and UNESCO activities. Uh, yes, Sabina, you have another question? Please. Yes, uh, I think one of the most important issues uh, that came out was to f uh, get an early technical support for building up a new net after a disaster and the second is uh, the question of warning before a disaster happens uh, and for me the question would be how do you avoid an uncontrolled mass panic uh, in cause of um, yeah, let's say information that are not correct or information that are uh, not not led by the government via the internet, via Twitter, via the social networks and um, how uh, to build up uh, after the destroyment uh, of all these infrastructural issues uh, to come to the places to build up the networks and how um, yeah, the capacity of these networks uh, can it deliver all the people who want to need to use their, their mobile devices so that they can use the services you offer. Thank you, and I see if not there was any from to the floor, may I ask Thomas? Yes, thank you. I have a follow-up question to Sabine's question. Uh, in the recent case of Sandy in the US, we've seen uh, a number of, of uh, uh, um, false information on Twitter that were put by individuals and that actually diverted, uh, um, needed help to other places. So. Uh, in the case of use of social network, how to ensure that the information is as accurate as possible. Thank you. Thank you. And Valeria, can you grab some microphone and give us the question? Can somebody bring in the microphone or... Gosh. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I could no, not hear you for a while. J just a moment. There was another question. Okay, sorry. Um, with the indulgence. Yes. Thank you. No? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. There is a question from Davis Joseph Wedi from Uganda. The question is, is the program about the disaster still ongoing and how can they measure the success of the radio station, especially the new network? Now I'd like to ask any panel members to respond. Mr. Fuji first. Oh, yes, sure. Um, so why don't I start with the, uh, the question of uh, social networking services um, and the, uh, the risks of uh, false information, misinformation, and uh, false rumors. So uh, the, uh, I think this was the first disaster in the Japan earthquake was the first disaster in which the uh, social media was probably used um, so extensively. Um, as I said, uh, in many parts of the region, it worked to cover the, um, the, the, the, the holes where the, uh, the, the, the traditional broadcasters were not, not able to cover. So it, was, it proved very useful. Um, and we did have cases uh, where there were um, risks of uh, people panicking due to misinformation. Uh, one uh, typical case was that, as I said, uh, oil refineries near Tokyo, um, they blew up and uh, people started, well somebody started tweeting that uh, they should not go outside because poisonous rains uh, due to this uh, burning oil refinery would fall um, and you would get poisoned by this um, poisonous rain. Um, scientifically, the, um, uh, this seems to be a false information. Um, and uh, so a lot of, lot of this information got panic, uh, uh, tweeted and people started panicking. The government, um, especially the National Police Agency, uh, did issue warnings and takedown requests to many social networking services and other internet portals to remove harmful information and information that caused people to panic. Um, now, however, the, uh, the industry took the position that more information is better um, than hiding information because once you start hiding information under the instructions of the government, 
um, people do not know which information to trust. So we took the position that more information, more accurate information uh, is better uh, so that we can correct that misinformation. Um, and we actually uh, worked with the Ministry of Communications and Ministry of Industry and Economy who sided with the industry, internet industry. And uh, so the industry and the two ministries worked together to uh, form a web platform uh, which is kind of like the, the chillingeffects.org uh, in the United States. So whenever we would get a uh, removal request from the police agency, we would post that information onto that website, and we would choose or not choose to remove it, but uh, the process uh, is all transparent. So, so that's how we uh, kept the right balance. Thank you. Um, balance, would you answer? Um, UNESCO, do you think, have you been approached or something like that? Uh, not really. I don't have any uh, relation right now with the UNESCO program or the ITU, but in locally in Indonesia, we have a uh, quite good coordination with the government, civil society, uh, journalists, and several other things. Yeah. But uh, I want to answer about the, how we trust the information when we have too many information in the social media. Yeah. Of course, uh, we have to train the people before the disaster. People have to know each other before the disaster. Like uh, the one portal I, I told before, the Jalin Merapi, they have about 800 of volunteers trained to how, how you manage a disaster. They, they know how, how to report, to make a report, good report, not make a panic on the people. That's why if there is uh, several Twitters from someone we don't know, there will be uh, volunteers that will recheck the information and if it's uh, valid, it will go to the uh, Twitter or other uh, social media. So it's not a instant process. I mean, we, we need a training, we need a collaboration with uh, several bodies, several uh, institutions to to be able to use uh, social media in an effective way. Yeah, um, and uh, so can I go on to the next question about broadcasting? Or Okay, so um, I wanted to respond to the question about broadcasting as well. I said that the collaboration between internet and broadcasting is very difficult in Japan. Um, I, I think it is that way in many of the other countries as well because um, you know, media convergence between traditional media and internet um, is a difficult topic. And you know, if this was resolved, I can go home very early every day. Um, anyway, so uh, uh, com traditional media complementing the information on the internet, this was easy, easy to achieve. Um, as I said, for example, we would air uh, commercials about what information is on the web. So, so the, um, the lack of information uh, by, uh, by the various uh, information platforms and, and uh, media, they complement each other. That's easy to do. The most difficult part is getting traditional media content directly on the web. Um, and so in, in Japan, you know, we've always had difficulties with the broadcasters because of issues with, with copyright and other business issues. Uh, but in this exceptional instance of uh, disaster relief, uh, the broadcasters were okay with um, airing their content on the internet. Um, and I think what is important is that um, the next time a disaster happens, we will already have concluded such an MOU that in those exceptional cases, such broadcasting would be permissible. Thank you. Could someone answer to the Zabinet's question about two things? Can you repeat the question? One element is early technical support uh, after the disaster. How do you build the infrastructure as quickly as possible? And the second question is how do you manage to deploy the warnings before early warnings before the disaster happens? A any um, ideas or lessons learned? Okay. Am I right? So, so um, yeah, I think. On the, the issue of uh, how to build the, the infrastructure as quickly as possible, um, I think that's all preparation and, and logistics. Um, you know, in, in Japan, um, the large telecoms such as NTT, KDDI, and, and uh, SoftBank, 
they were able to um, you know get up there uh, using their vehicles very quickly and resume communications um, so uh, that's due to their technical expertise I think um, I, I don't think it's something that an, an internet company can do it's not it's not in the web layer um, and um, as for uh, sorry um, what was the uh, the second question again that's the warning before it happens. right right yeah so uh, public alerts is also a, uh, a disaster preparation tool that Google has. So, so there is a lot of um, public information that are out there. Um, for example, in, in case of Japan, we have the, uh, the Japan Meteorological Agency, which gives you alerts about, um, you know, not necessarily earthquakes, but um, storms and typhoons. Um, but such information, uh, we need partnership with these uh, organizations and government agencies so that such information can be quickly deployed on the web. Um, and there are issues with uh, data formats and there are also contractual issues, but these are things that we need to work on um, before the crisis happens. Thank you. We are a bit running over the estimated time frame. Um, so, but last but not least, it, there's one question from Uganda um, about the ongoing disaster. And how do we measure the success of the radio services? Am I right? That area? Okay. Anybody can take up and uh, how do you measure the su success? Yeah, it's uh, very difficult to measure correctly what we do in the disaster area is a success or not because uh, the conditions usually is not uh, ideal. But uh, the most important thing is how you can save lives, how you can uh, make the condition more comfortable for the refugee and how you can support all the relief program. I think it's more important than uh, we just make an evaluation success or not. I think um, we need to sort of have some transition to the second part. Uh, before moving, so I'd like to just try summarize 30 seconds of what we heard. Um, I think they all emphasize the importance of information not necessarily information technology. Whatever information you have inside the devastated areas that work, that's what they need. The sometimes lack of infrastructure may cause some disruptions, um, electricity, but sometimes that is human errors or misinformation could be troublesome. But with a combination of the conventional medium and the uh, new media, that may address some of the areas which never been able before. Um, also, the question of free flow of information versus some kind of social constraints, if not IPR, but there have been some IPR or copyright issues of the government and other websites during the earthquake in Japan, whether the for the public use, can you use them without any, gra you know, granting the right. And some brave guys did that anyway for the radiation and other areas. How much is, are they tolerated under the exceptional circumstances only, or could we have some kind of measures prior to these so that we can, you know, have no um, frictions on the fly when something of that magnitude happens. Um, and we will have these speakers on board until the end of the session because some of the questions we may have later in the second part of the question about free flow of information versus some other rights or media, uh, the traditional media and the, the internet questions might be relevant uh, from the lessons we learned from the disaster areas. Um, but with that, I'd like to thank the two speakers and, and we'd like to, I'd like to hand over the coordination to our colleagues out there. Um, can't see them. Thomas and Anna. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, um, after uh, this very interesting presentation about uh, the world, uh, now um, with the internet and, uh, and the digital media, um, I think that we are going to discuss uh, other components uh, uh, of, this, uh, of this society. Uh, before and after the, the internet and the digital media. So the main points here that we are going to put uh, on, on the table for discussion are 
What are the implications of the use of new technical and political instruments in the Internet age? The dialogue around these questions should embrace a wide range of issues such as the free flow of information, the human rights, the freedom of expression, access to information, new business models, um, are there common challenges for old and new media? Um, the user-generated content online, how much is it uh, reliable? Um, the impact of the low-cost mobile access to the internet and the use of the same screen uh, by the new internet services and the traditional media such as broadcast TV and radio but with different rules. So we have uh, uh, three speakers here. Uh, I'm going to moderate from the, government, uh, from the governmental point of view. I work for the government so my point of view is always uh, to give the best to, the, to all stakeholders um, and it's very interesting that we have uh, three moderators here uh, one from a civil society one from from the government and another one from the private sector that is Thomas so I give the floor to Thomas thank you very much and um, uh, to follow up on what Anna has been saying I will moderate I will co-moderate this session from a private sector um, angle. What I would like to say is that uh, in addition to what has been said already, this is a brave new world outside, a brave new world for all of us, a lot of new things happening and for companies uh, this brave new world have are, are, are real implications and those questions that we are going to deal with now uh, um, are affect not only the large companies that you can see on the table here, but small and medium companies as well, not only in the rich and developed countries, but all over the world, and in particular more and more in, in emerging economies. I would also like to point out before we start that after the, this discussion, tomorrow and after tomorrow, there will be four workshops that will drill down on those particular issues. Um, so workshop 92, workshop 146, workshop 138, and 169. So if you are interested to learn even more about those issues, please do attend one of or all of those four workshops. So uh, having said that, uh, we are going to ask the first speaker to give us her perspective, and that is going uh, to be uh, Sabine Verheyen from the European Parliament. Thank you very much, Thomas. I think we have a wide range of questions about what governments, what uh, internet governance should look like if we want to assure that we have an open and free internet, that we uh, respect the fundamental rights of freedom of speech, freedom of information, free flow, free flow of information, uh, the technical uh, things, but also to make uh, the internet a safe place for people and to ensure uh, um, yeah, also internet, intellectual property rights in the new medias. So the question we have to deal with um, is to bring all these different interests together in a very balanced way in a cultural uh, surrounding, in a cultural, it's not working quite well, in a, in a cultural environment that is very, very different and, and specific uh, in each country, but the internet is not just to to be a local. It's not just just there to find local solutions, but it's there to find global solutions, and that's the reason why we need a wide and big exchange between different stakeholders and this multi-stakeholder approach we have here, because we cannot solve the problems that are coming up with. Perhaps I take another one. Thank you. I think it's better now. Yeah. Um, I think we have to we have to find a wide range of, of solutions and uh, to discuss this very intensively. 
There's one point, uh, for example, the question of net neutrality that will be uh, posed uh, in the next years uh, not and, and months, not just on the European level, but also on the next wicket. We will uh, discuss uh, over these, these things. Uh, net neutrality is important in order to guarantee equal access to high-speed networks, which is crucial to the quality and legitimate online audiovisual services. The problem is when uh, even where legal alternatives do exist, online copyright infringement remains an issue and therefore the legal online availability of copyrighted cultural material needs to be supplemented with smarter online enforcement of copyright while fully respecting fundamental rights, notably freedom of information and speech and protection of personal data and the right to privacy. The digitization and preservation of cultural resources along with enhanced access to such resources offer great economical and social opportunities and therefore we don't need a system where, for example, internet providers and service providers and uh, the telecommunic telecommunication companies decide which data package is delivered fast, which is uh, slow, so we have to find solutions to have really a net neutrality so that also small and medium-sized enterprises that also individuals can offer their, their um, um, uh, services and their content. Um, a very important thing is the accessibility of the net. And uh, there one point is the, the question of the financing, financing the infrastructure, financing and find technological solutions for different ways of building up infrastructure to have a worldwide good access. And especially in Europe we have problems with the rural areas where you don't have uh, the same uh, high-speed accessibility of the net in, in many areas. So um, we had a big discussion also on the uh, spectrum debate on uh, how to, to deliver uh, broadband uh, and, and fast internet access via LTE and other technologies. And I think we should be, op we should be open to other technologies too, because we found out that in a long-term uh, view uh, the LTE technology will not deliver all the needs we will have if we have e-health, e-government, e-skills, uh, uh, in many, many ways learning uh, electronically the social exchange we have. Um, and uh, there will be a wide range of data and if the, this technology as alone, alone will deliver the capacity we need in future is the big question. So uh, I think we should uh, be open uh, in the technology debate which kind of technology combined, combining for example wireless systems, LTE systems, uh, uh, uh, glass fiber systems, that are questions we have to solve on, on, a, on a very wide approach and not just on a very specific point of view because spectrum for example is not uh, to widen up, we just have a, a separate quote of spectrum that is available and we have to be careful because it's a public good and uh, cannot be just taken for, for just commercial use. I think I stop uh, with this, there are many many questions of free, free flow of information but I want to give also the other colleagues the opportunity to get an entrance to this and uh, I think I will come back to some points afterwards when it comes to uh, uh, intellectual property rights. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and now I think that the floor is to Patrick Ryan, please. Thank you very much. I'm going to take off my headphones. So somebody hit me if you say something, if, there's a, if somebody says something. But I find it very frustrating and uh, I'm a little bit unable to speak while listening to myself speak as well. Um, my focus is going to be on question four, the opportunities and challenges about accessing content over different sources. Increasingly, users are getting content from apps, mobile apps on their mobile phones and on their tablets. And there have been calls to regulate apps in a new way. Like the cloud, a few years ago, there were calls to regulate the cloud as if it was something new and shiny. It was the bright, shiny object that everybody wanted to uh, regulate because it's new. But now we, of course, know that the cloud is the Internet. And it's impossible to pass rules that specifically regulate the cloud without regulating the Internet at large. And that's what's happening in many cases with apps today. What are apps? At its core, all apps are is software. 
that's it. We don't have any special regulation for software on floppy disks, software on CDs, anything that's installed on the computer, per se. There's no Software Act. There's no uh, software legislation. There were experiments in the 1970s to look at software as a special thing, but in the end, lawmakers realized that consumer protections that already exist apply to software just like they apply to any other product that any other company sells. So as to apps, should we regulate them in a special way, even though software is not regulated in a special way? Software is software, is software is software. It doesn't matter where it runs, whether it's in a data center or on a mobile phone or rendering through an HTML page. So the challenge before us in the course of the next few years is going to be to come up with common rules that apply across platforms to devices, regardless of how they may be labeled, cloud, desktop, or mobile. So as I mentioned, at the core of all of these devices is code, is software. All of our devices that we use, and many of us have multiple devices, phones, tablets, PCs, they're all supercomputers. Why should it matter how the device connects to the internet? Whether it's connected by fiber, by copper wire, by Wi-Fi, or by licensed spectrum. All of these things are very important in order to be able to assure that consumers have access, but as to the data themselves and the regulation of the software itself, consumers don't know the difference and they don't care how their devices are connected to the internet. Since the user doesn't care, why should regulators? In some of the calls for regulating apps, some have suggested that location is a differentiator because people are on the move. We therefore need to regulate the software that moves with them differently. This just isn't the case. Computers that connect to the internet online through their IP addresses already provide information about location of the user. And in fact, when users access the internet on their mobile phone, most providers allow them to disactivate the location sensitivity so that they can um, essentially hide where they're located from, uh, from, from whoever it is that wants to find them. And it's not that these things should be unregulated, it's that they already are regulated through consumer protection laws and other things that are cross-cutting. For example, the Fair and Deceptive Trade Practices Act in the United States applies to any product, as I mentioned earlier, across companies. And these regulations do have teeth. Finally, in regulating apps, some say that the screen size matters, that smaller screens mean that consumers need more protection. In fact, again, this is the opposite of what is in fact true today. If anything, the smaller screen sizes are helping consumers. Consumers still need the contract in order to purchase software, in order to download apps. But rather than having to read a very thick terms of service book that comes with shrink wrap software that very few consumers ever read, what's happening is companies are providing their terms of service on one very small screen size. And it's working. According to the Pew Internet Research Report, 50% of all app users have decided not to install an app on their mobile phone after they discovered how much personal information they would need to share in order to use it. So they read it on their small screen size and then decide not to purchase. That's a sign that, th that things are improving, that contracting between providers and consumers is getting better. And in fact, the smaller screen size helps with that because it makes it simpler for people to understand. And they're reading contracts that they may never have read previously. So, rather than passing new laws for apps, we should regulate the abuse of technology, not the use of it. To the extent possible, rely on existing laws in our, on our books. Uh, cybercrime is one example. And the many criminal laws that are on the books all around the world have been used to put bad guys in jail uh, for fraud and for theft and for many other things, both in the real space and in the virtual space. We should be legislat legislatively agnostic about which ecosystem is better and not create rules that support one ecosystem over another. Finally, we should encourage innovation and change, allowing the market to develop and for users to tell us what they love 
and we shouldn't regulate based on technical categories, whether it's mobile or cloud or apps. It may be convenient for us to think of things in this way. I can tell you as a lawyer, it's sometimes convenient to say I'm a specialist in a particular area of law and to hold myself out as that specialist and to charge premium rates. But if you agree with me that the main difference between these devices is their screen size or whether or not they have a keyboard, it's simply harder and harder to justify separate regulation for these things because of those physical characteristics. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Um, and the third speakers will be Giacomo uh, Mazzone from the European Broadcasting Union. And before Giacomo starts, I just want to uh, um, agree with Patrick on one particular point, which is that indeed uh, more and more content, and in particular for kids, is consumed through apps. That's a very clear trend that we are observing all over the world. So that's a, that's a fact of life and that's only the beginning. That's uh, how we see it. Anyway, Giacomo, up to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, the media people uh, are rare at the IGF. There are two at this table. That is quite uh, an exceptional average. Um, you talk about contents, uh, we don't call contents, we call, we call newspapers, we call radio, we call TV programs, we call movies, because this is our reason to be here and to be in the market since ages. Uh, so contents is quite indistinct and you don't know what it's about, it's something that flows quite natural. It's not the case in my opinion. And, uh, there is behind a lot of reflection and a lot of rights incorporated in it. Not only rights of the owner or of the authors, but also rights of the citizen in terms of how they access to this contents, how they uh, can uh, use it, how they can uh, make uh, better the life using this information. We have seen how important it is in the case of the emergency uh, to have access to traditional media because uh, there is a data that was missing before that uh, was important when uh, Izumi uh, last year presented us the results of the um, inquiry about the situation in Japan. It, that the information, the flow of information to the citizen about the emergency came through mobile tel telephones for the first six hours when the battery ran out. Then the next uh, 24 hours, the only source of information were uh, radio. Um, filled by batteries, is that the only way for people to get information in the disaster area. So the, the media, traditional media have an important role to play and a complementary role to play that is distinct and uh, has to be considered. But coming to uh, the emerging issues, this is the session about the emerging issues. I think that the most important issues that we have today to consider is the fact that there are walls that are coming uh, in, in marching in the same area, marching on the same uh, path. There is the area of the um, traditional media, the television for instance, and the area of the internet that are going to insist uh, toward the same uh, time of attention of the citizen. But are differently regulated, with very different regulation going on. And this regulation in Europe, for instance, or in, uh, in North America or in Japan, uh, it's a fruit uh, and is the rival of a um, dozen of years of uh, uh, social fights or um, uh, acquisition of um, new rights from a certain part of the population. So the day that we say that um, we use all these different sources in, a, in an indistinctive way because uh, there is no more distinction between the, the device and there is no more distinction within the kind of connection. We have to be aware that this means that the different level of protection that we have in a certain environment or in another uh, tend to vanish. Because when you put all on the same level, of course the lower level of protection applies. Um, the connected TV, that is the new phenomenon of the last year, is a, a typical example. Uh, as broadcasters, uh, we have in Europe a certain number of obligations 
about the TV. For instance, when there is an electoral campaign, we are very heavily regulated about the time constraint, about how to split the time between the different uh, uh, actors in, in, uh, in the field. Uh, we, we cannot uh, have campaigning in the last days of, um, before the elections, different from the US. We don't have, uh, um, we don't have um, advertising or very regulated advertising, etc. Et Tomorrow, today, we do Connected TV, which regulation applies? The last election in, uh, in France was a typical example. In France, they ban um, on TV and radio, on traditional media, the uh, possibility to announce beforehand the results before the, um, the ballots were closed. But this was completely screwed up for, uh, because the, the, um, on the internet, this information were already there, available four hours before the ballots were closed. Okay, is right or is wrong, but it's a regulation of the, the, of the French state that they decide that in order to protect the, the right of the citizen to express their vote without it being influenced, there is a regulation. But this regulation now is going vanishing because of the new situation. So we need to find a new level of protection and regulation, but as not to be the lowest possible. Because the lowest possible means that the part of the world that is benefit of certain protection today, tomorrow will be less protected. Okay, thank you, Giacomo. Uh, I think that uh, that's um, uh, that's it for the interventions. What we would like to do now with uh, Anna and, and Izumi, who is somewhere in the room, yeah, is there, is to get uh, as much engagement from the room as possible. This is your session. This is an open session. We would like really to hear from you. Clearly, we have we, we heard a little, little different things between the three main speakers, and in particular on the place of regulation. Uh, uh, so please, uh, who wants to go first? Any volunteer? Yes, we have a volunteer. No? No. Do we have a remote question? Okay, we have one here. Well, um, I'm, uh, I'm the most... I'm moderating, but uh, um, I, I would like to emphasize uh, several things from what we heard from our very good speakers. Uh, they were very different, uh, but don't forget that we are here discussing emerging issues. So it was very uh, interesting uh, to hear that uh, uh, global challenges deserve wide range of solutions that net neutrality is important to have equal access, uh, that fundamental rights, freedom of expression, privacy and personal data, they cannot be forgotten, that accessibility of the internet is very important and in Europe, for instance, to, to the rural uh, areas. Um, then uh, in the part of opportunities and uh, challenges, um, it was very interesting to hear that uh, if you want to regulate the cloud, you have to regulate the internet. Do you agree with that or not? Uh, so the user doesn't care how he is connected to the internet. So why to regulate it? Do you agree or not? Um, and then it was very interesting what Giacomo said, that media normally uh, they are not, they are rare in the internet governance uh, the, uh, for, uh, of, uh, of discussion, despite its complementary role. Uh, and it's very interesting to see that TV is very regulated and internet is not. So this, uh, well, I, I, I, I, I picked uh, up these, uh, these issues as very interesting and I wonder if uh, uh, from the audience is uh, anyone that would like to raise. You have to push on the red button. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Yep. At the
Hello. Yes, we good. You hear me? Yes. Okay. Could you please Thank say you. who? Could um, you please say who you my are? My name is Janet Hofmann. I'm a German researcher. I have first a question to Giacomo. Um, I wonder if you argue for sort of regulating internet content the way we've used to regulate traditional media. Would you be prepared to accept that this could mean that we will also get more territorial national borders on the internet as we used to have as a requirement for national regulation of traditional media? That would be my first question to Giacomo. And then I have also a question to Patrick. Um, there has been a discussion uh, where people ask about transparency, more transparency as uh, with regard to what uh, content providers, service providers do with the data of the users they collect. Um, do you agree that this is a good idea that users should know in greater detail what companies do with the u with the data of users Jacob can you go first thank you um, the regulation um, I'm not seeking for more regulation I simply say that uh, regulation is the crystallization of um, a civilization uh, so in Europe we arrived to a certain uh, regulation or in Japan and other countries because there has been years and years of uh, events that they bring to that regulation in order to set up the rules that there is a judge in, uh, in Berlin. This, this was fundamental for creating Europe. To, to, we have uh, rules where even the king has to answer uh, to the last of the, the citizen of his uh, kingdom. So we need to have this kind of regulation. If we give up with the current regulation, we need to know where we go and which level of lower regulation we are ready to accept, knowing that each regulation means that we renounce a certain level of rights for the citizen and for the economic subject and for all people that are concerned. Coming back to, to the point of the territories, um, yes, we have already a lot of examples in which, for instance, uh, programs are sold or rights are sold, but Thomas can know better than me, uh, f uh, for languages. The satellite distribution, for instance, is typical because if you sell uh, a program for the German market, the German language market, usually you, you sell also Austrian and um, German Switzerland because they go together. So this exists because the, the new busing of the internet is more based on the language, uh, part of the English that is lang lingua franca, so it's more complicated, but for all the other languages you have uh, homogeneous bassins that could be used as a reference. Thank you, and uh, before Patrick goes on, I just want to add to that point that uh, the language issue, it's about really cultural diversity in, in one aspect, and the other one is uh, as, as Disney company, when it comes to kids, parents want their kids to learn first their national language, and then maybe and then maybe another language like English. So the the, the, the, the point of delivering content in your national language is very strong for kids education, and that doesn't and that doesn't mean uh, it's uh, uh, it's it's it prevents other language to be also thought through uh, this process. But Patrick. And, uh, and, uh, and then we'll have a comment from Sabine as well. Thank you, Jeanette. Absolutely, no question. Uh, more transparency is a, is a very good thing for users. And I would even add that users should be asking questions, not just about transparency, but even more so about security and how the stewards of personal data, the companies that end up collecting personal data from, from users and, and various different uh, tools and products that are used how, you know, so to, to make sure that the companies are held accountable for how that data is kept secure. Uh, so for example, one of the things that we've been talking about a lot is educating users about two-factor authentication, ways to make sure that data on our products, on Google's platform, are secured not just by a single password, but by having an additional factor, an additional security layer um, that, uh, that provides an additional key in order for um, 
in order for the user to access even their own data, which you know by by, uh, by proxy also helps make sure that others can't get into it. And so, uh, privacy issue is an important one, but security issue is something that needs to be that I think needs to be uh, uh, discussed a lot more in this context. Okay, Sabine. Yes, I just want to make some remarks to the question of hybrid TV or connected TV. I think uh, the consumers have access to a very regulated audiovisual content and uh, a non-regulated online content on the same screen. And you sometimes have the problem that not all of the users can defer while watching a movie with this uh, regulated or watching uh, uh, a TV program, a broadcasted program, and beside you have on the same screen other, other offers. And especially in questions of child protection and other things, we need solutions to make clear that you are dealing with uh, different uh, systems on the same screen. screen. At the moment, for example, the European Commission makes a consultation on this question of TV, uh, uh, connected TV, and in the end of the year they will offer a, a, a green, green book uh, and, and, and show us how was the, the outcome of this uh, uh, um, of this que question uh, round would be, and uh, we will uh, discuss it in the in the in the parliament during the next month. And most, the main questions, with the policymakers need to solve will be which degree of regulation and minor protection can consumers expect when using connected TV, and how can fair competition be ensured between providers of regulated and not regulated content. I think it's a question of uh, how these both players deal with each other and how would a new qualitative minimum standard be designed and implemented in order to comply with the obligations of public interest. The protection of minors, media pluralism, cultural diversity, consumer protection, promotion of European cultural content. There are so many questions we, we have to solve and there is not a fixed solution yet, but we have to work on this and we have to find uh, to, to get a big impact from, from many sides so that we kind of fair and good solution for the new technology and the new challenges and chances that are combined with this. Thank you. Another reaction? Yep. I've been, I've been encouraged to uh, ask a follow-up question. Um, can, can you hear me? Um, and that would be actually about the we you've mentioned. Who is actually the agency that should set the rules. Is it when it comes to private content, the terms of services of uh, content producers who should, who should set the rules or should also sort of uh, with regard to the multi-stakeholder process, should um, the users who buy or consume those content issues, should they also have a role in this? And I'd like to come back to the issue with several languages. I know, for example, that lots of German users would access content in English if they could, but very often they can't. And it seems right now that nobody asks them. So it's also, if you create boundaries by languages, how difficult this is actually to overcome those boundaries. In Europe, I don't need a passport any longer to go from country A to country B. But when it comes to digital content on the internet, it's very difficult to overcome such boundaries. So who should set the rules? Sabine, you want to? Yeah. There are many, many questions and many uh, rules and laws and, and regulations you are talking about if you talk about this wide issue because the copyright question and the way uh, copyright is organized until now without having regard on the special aspect of, of a worldwide internet is covered by this question you are, you are asking and uh, the we is not just the politicians to do because I say we now have consultations so all the stakeholders are able to give their input their input into the discussion. We will have discussions during the parliamentary process, so it, it's a democratic process, if there, rule, if there will be rules for uh, uh, uh, connected TV. It's not clear how it will be look like because we, we have to work together on a, on a, on a multi-stakeholder level, let's say like this, but the decision taking is via a democratic elected uh, parliament and, and system if we make rules afterwards and if we have we see that there is uh, the, the need for new rules. 
on that. At the moment, we just see the problem and the challenges, and we have to find solutions for, uh, let's say, two different markets coming together onto the same platform with different rules, and that's not not fair for both sides. And I think uh, that's the reason why we need solutions. And we is not just one person and not just one agency. Uh, that's a process of, of of decision taking on the political level. Before we, we, we change questions, and I'm not forgetting your point about language, I'm giving a chance to any other panelist who wants to uh, say something. Giacomo? Absolutely. <clears throat> uh, the, the problem of the language is crucial and essential because the cultural diversity is based on language. And um, uh, we have a, one of the main problems we have uh, in this development is that um, the aboli abolition of national barriers, national boundaries uh, provoked by the internet um, means that there are less resources available um, all, over, all over the countries and this becomes more um, crucial in countries that are uh, small uh, or have a small linguistic basin. Uh, how to produce, how to continue to ensure a production of uh, quality contents in countries that have only one million inhabitants sharing the same language, uh, while the resource of the advertising uh, are going more and more towards the internet. This is a, a, a problem that uh, for the moment has not solution because there is a transfer of resources. This means that there are less resources in the country to finance national products. And if you don't, uh, this will affect more what we call identity products, the, the programs that reflect the national culture, the national heritage, the national language, and uh, is an increasing problem to which I don't see solution because there is no business model that could. Uh, deal with that at the moment. Thank you. Any Patrick, and then uh, Patrick, and then Sabine, and then Co. And then we have a question from the floor as well. So Patrick, Sabine, and Co. And the question from the floor. Thank you, Tomas. I'll, I'll uh, give another perspective on the language, uh, on the language question, which I think is a very good one. And access to content in foreign languages. Obviously, there's a lot of content that's available around the world in English. I personally have found it very frustrating and very difficult as somebody who appreciates and wants to learn other foreign languages, particularly European languages, to get access to that content while in the United States. So for example, if I go on, you know, I'm not picking on iTunes, but it's a you know, great product, I use it a lot. Um, and so when I go on iTunes and want to download French movies or German movies, they're just unavailable if I live in the United States. Uh, and I went through a process one time where I set up an account uh, in order to uh, access French content using a uh, French address that I ended up, uh, please don't tell anybody, I guess this is all public, but <laughs> we'll just ignore that for a minute, but I set up a French address at a hotel that I once stayed at in France and um, in order to be able to have a local address and be able to download local French content so that I could continue to have access to you know, that, that, that type of resource. And that, type of workaround is just crazy. Users want to access uh, content in language that they want, not language it, you know, that's determined for them uh, you know, ad hoc. And I think we need to work hard at changing the system in order to be able to address the, you know, the demands of users um, and uh, make uh, you know, international content more available in both ways on the internet. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, um, Sabine? I just want to come back to one point uh, I've forgotten to mention. Uh, it's not just the question of uh, the same regulation for the connected TV platforms. It's also the question of the, the net neutrality or let's say the, uh, uh, the, the gateway position also such platforms like a connected TV have. Now at the moment you don't have really a free internet access to all what you want, but you have in these systems we have at the moment a gatekeeping process and uh, so we have to, to make sure uh, from the consumer's perspective that we have a free choice and pluralism, pluralism with regard to content and access to this technology and to the devices. And I think there is a need for, for taking a special look on what's going on there uh, so that we uh, open up and then that we don't have a concentration of several markets and that we have a fair uh, a competition also on, on, the, on the, the content providing uh, markets. Thank you, Sabine. Cool. 
Yes, um, I just wanted to make a comment on content regulations, and um, I, I do um, agree and disagree with Giacomo on the um, uh, how we regulate content across different devices and uh, different media. So um, I, I think uh, if you are regulating a content, um, depending on the nature of the content, um, it should not make a difference what media or what device. Uh, or uh, what uh, what type of mechanism you are using to distribute the content. Um, defamation is always defamation. Um, copyright infringement is copyright infringement, whether it's it's on the internet or it's it's broadcasted. Um, child porn is always child porn. So uh, these things that should um, regulate, depending on the pure nature of the content, should be regulated across platforms or, or across media. Um, however, I do would like to um, bring up a uh, traditional argument, which um, people have different uh, opinions about, um, which is that TV is different, um, broadcasting is different, and in, in that it is giving a, a position of a responsible steward of uh, spectrum, which is a public uh, property, so um, which is a limited resource and it is given a special position by the government um, to broadcast this content to the people, um, which is not the same with internet. Um, with internet, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the content can be as diverse as you want. If you disagree, you just put up another website. It is not so with TV. So um, I think that is one aspect where TV differs from um, internet. But I think if you look at the pure nature of the content itself, um, regulation should be uh, the same across the, across the board. Very good. Uh, I just want to add my own personal two cents on that, is that there is also the question of there is content and content. And what we are seeing is that uh, uh, in particular because of the, uh, of the internet, which is a fantastic enabler to actually distribute more content to more people across the globe, there is still a very, very strong demand, and in particular in emerging economies for premium quality content. And, that's, and that is actually very good news uh, alongside user generated content. It's not one versus the other, it's the two going along. But the, actually, the, the emergence of mobile internet, like in, in like in Southeast Asia, has actually increased the demand for premium content, uh, quality content, which I think is, is is good news for all actors in this ecosystem. And that you know, this is a good example that the positive convergence is happening. Um, unless there is another comment on this on those questions, I will give the floor to the gentleman here, uh, and I think you have a microphone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My name is Masanobu Kato. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my name is Masanobu Kato, uh, private sector participants. I also have a question uh, to Giacomo uh, regarding uh, uh, levels of uh, regulations. You mentioned that uh, if there are you know, different levels of regulations, always the lowest regulation may apply. Um, I'm just, uh, you, know, you know, want to make sure if that's uh, the case or not. In many cases, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, here's one example. You know, sometimes market mechanism applies. If uh, you you have too much, uh, too uh, you know, lowest regulations, and uh, if uh, you don't have enough security protection, for instance, well, companies, countries, and people try to uh, you know protect themselves. Uh, try to make some. Uh, you know, laws sometimes, some local rules, or more like uh, uh, the industry you know, mechanism for protecting uh, those, uh, you know, security. That's one example. Another case is in a case of, uh, for instance, criminal areas or, you know, copyright where, uh, you know, people uh, try to, you know, have a lowest, uh, you, know, uh, you know, protection. Uh, some countries, for instance, tend to criminalize. Uh, you know those activities that have some you know negative impact. So therefore, you know, therefore, the lowest uh, you know regulation may not be the best in that case. Uh, you know, too. and a third example is you know copyright is another uh, you know case. The right holders may say you know they need more protection, and uh, if you you know see those lowest you know level of protection, you know it doesn't work. It has much you know worse uh, you know impact. Uh, having more 
uh, you know, tend to have more, uh, you know, protection for uh, the, you know, right holders. So, uh, therefore, the question you know, really is, what is it, you know, balanced regulation? What is the best way of, you know, regulating this? Is that the law, the market mechanism? Uh, I guess that's the broader question to you. Thank you very much. I think it's a question for everybody in this room, so not to me. But um, thank you, Mr. Kato, for, for the question. Um, I think that um, the, there is the, is not something that can be solved by tomorrow. But let's say that, for instance, if we say that we apply to to our countries uh, the regulation existing in the countries. Uh, so the regulation of the user and not the regulation of the source, probably this could for a while uh, create um, an environment in, with, in which we could discuss properly and to find a common solution. Because today in the internet what applies is the regulation of the, of the owner of the, um, of the distribution platform. So on Facebook you apply the, the rules of uh, California law. In, uh, on uh, Google, you apply Google uh, national country of origin law, etc., etc. And this creates a lot of problems to us. So let's say that if we say that in the distribution of contents over the internet, you apply the, the country rules or the region rules, because country sometimes could be very difficult. But in Europe, we have example of regional laws that applies regional rules. Th this could be. Uh, a temporary tra transitional moment that could bring to a global regulation later. A global regulation that, again, I would like not to be the lowest possible. Just to make you an example, very simple, uh, on the problem that we face every day. It took in, in Europe 20 years, Ms. Verayan knows very well, to arrive to ban the advertising um, of tobacco on car racing. You know that Formula One is based on tobacco advertising. It took 20 years for legislation in the parliament to arrive to ban this. Tomorrow, with the connected TV, if I would be the, the platform owner, the Samsung or the Google or the Apple, uh, when, uh, I, when I see that you are watching uh, Formula One on TV screen, I would put on the internet screen that is just beside the advertising on tobacco. It's the easiest formula that you can apply. It makes money and it will completely vanish all the 40, 20 years uh, discussion that we had in the parliament. Is this correct? Is this fine? Is fair? I don't know. <laughs> I leave to you the... Sabine also has a comment on that? I think it's it's uh, the general question you asked. Uh, we have many, many different, yeah, let's say, uh, sometimes uh, in cause of the, the culture in a country, but also in the, in the, in the lawmaking, in the, in the tradition of the country, different uh, kinds of regulation for several parts of, of content. Uh, but on the internet, it doesn't it isn't worth anymore because uh, I can get uh, uh, to to internet pages from all over the world, and it's always the the local law, the regional law, or the national law that is relevant to the content they provide. And I think uh, we have to look on, on on several sides. One side is the side of the consumer, uh, who wants to, who is used to uh, that uh, uh, kind of that standard of safety. Uh, he is used in his country. Uh, consumer protection is one, one question in this. But also, for example, the data protection is... He, uh, he is used to a special kind of data protection while using uh, uh, traditional devices, tradi traditional media uh, and traditional uh, offers. But in the Internet, there is no, no, no, let's say, global uh, um, law for, for, um, for personal right, for... for uh, for, for data protection and other other regulations we have in, in different countries. The, the, let's say one example, um, uh, Giacomo said it's uh, in Europe not just the 24 countries, uh, uh, it's uh, 27 countries, it's also regional law that is uh, um, 
relevant for the people there. Because we have, for example, in Germany, 16 different countries in our, in our state, different states in, in, in Germany, and they all have a different uh, data protection law. And so it's very difficult also for those who provide content, who provide a service, to find uh, the right way to do, to be compatible with all the different laws that exist. If you want to provide a worldwide service, uh, you have to take uh, into account uh, the, the, the, the law of uh, many, many countries all over the world if you want to make it correct and uh, uh, uh, compatible with the, with the existing law. And that's the problem we have when we don't have bigger solutions than, that, than just the, the national or the regional solutions. We need more global solutions for uh, rules, for regulations uh, on the internet uh, com uh, um, in, in, in relation to data protection, in relation to uh, consumer protection, child protection and all these things. And we have to, to find out common solutions for that. And I think the problems will stay like they are as long as we don't find worldwide common solution and agreements on that. Thank you. Um, I would like to, uh, Valence, uh, I would like to get your perspective if it's possible since you come from Indonesia, a vibrant uh, a country with a lot of people who are young, uh, below 30 years old, and since it's, this is an emerging issues uh, a session, how, how do you see this debate that we are just talking about, about you know, me, media regulation? How do you see it evolving from your perspective? Okay. Um, yeah, right now we have a lot of uh, new internet users in Indonesia, especially uh, the users that maybe don't not realize if they are using an internet because they, they use a cell phone or smartphone. They use a Facebook, Twitter, but if we ask them, uh, do you use internet, maybe they thing that they don't use internet they just uh, think that uh, maybe f Twitter or Facebook the same with the text messaging not the internet but uh, that's the reality that uh, we have a lot of uh, users new users that uh, using those kind of media and about uh, the law and regulation about the new media we have also uh, a lot of difficulties to access a lot of contents in the US based content especially that we cannot uh, access the content because uh, we are using the IP address or account based on uh, Indonesia especially in uh, iTunes or several others uh, content also and uh, of course the the law is the law and the people know how to deal with it and they they make uh, another account with uh, using uh, another address and in Indonesia it's quite easy to have a US based uh, iTunes card they just buy the prepaid card and they make a US account it's a uh, it's quite common because uh, the the law and the regulation is very strict and not uh, flexible but uh, I want to to underline several interesting things about uh, how people use the new media especially the Twitter and the Facebook we have several uh, law process that uh, interferes by the social media one thing is the maybe it's uh, one or two years ago it's a uh, Prita Sari, that's a uh, one woman who wrote a uh, comment about the hospital services, about the bad uh, hospital services. They go to, uh, she, she, she went to the jail because uh, the hospital think that uh, this woman make a bad uh, name for the hospital. But uh, the people in the social media very crowd about this issue and they collect uh, money to pay the fine and uh, I think they they got almost 80,000 US dollar in coin yeah uh, you, you, you imagine that uh, the biggest coin in Indonesia is less than uh, one cent of the US so it's a uh, 80,000 of uh, US and uh, they collect it uh, I think thousands of maybe 10,000 of people collecting uh, coins to pay the fine 
and then uh, finally the the court of Indonesia released her without any uh, penalty or fine but it's a uh, we we we understand that it's a uh, push very hard from the social media that the gov government and or other bodies should think about a uh, freedom of uh, uh, freedom of expression also yeah i think it's a, a good case on in the law of indonesia and also uh, related with the freedom of expression in the internet thank you thank you valens um uh, so uh, any any question from the room uh, izumi and anna are, are in the room any somebody wants to pick it up from the audience or from remote participation no if not well this is not the question from the floor but question from me if, if you allow or just a co sort of co com combination with what um, balance just said because um, Valence didn't elaborate when you made a pre presentation about the volcano evacuation thing in 2011, mm. am I correct? Yes. Um, he said that there was some use of the Twitter. Yeah. But actually what happened was some more than 100,000 people or 150,000 people mm. who had to leave their house or evacuation camp after 2, 2 a.m. They have to walk down to the villages lower yeah lower uh, three hours away, yeah. away or something like that yeah and alas they had all the breakfast prepared ready around seven right yes explain why <laughs> yes uh you know that uh we at the first stage we have uh, 50,000 of refugee on the high level and after the 1 a.m the government asked to make the evacuation area bigger and they they re remove all the refugee to the lower area and the refugee become uh, 100,000 people what happened is the all the equipment of the refugee camp is still on the high area that's that's what the government have at that time and we don't have uh, anything to prepare the breakfast for all the refugee and start from the 2 a.m. Uh, people start tweeting and <coughs> at the morning at the 7 a.m. or something uh, the people of Yogyakarta managed to have a breakfast in the box or any kind of the breakfast uh, to serve uh, hundreds of thousands of the refugee. I think uh, Izumi if I uh, allowed uh, I have a friend here from Indonesia also maybe uh, Sita or Doni can tell more about this uh, story where are they uh, in the front uh, yeah okay. thank yes. you so much my name is Sita from Indonesia from from Hivos um, I think I would like to add what Fallen said about the volcano and to add what uh, to, to answer the Izumi's questions the main point of the volcano is not only about the Twitter and the Facebook but also beforehand the, the community radio stations in the volcano slopes are really working very hard and they already uh, make mobilizations and uh, make a routine information on the status of the volcano from I think eight years ago or, or five years ago so I think the community itself is already strong enough and the Twitter and the Facebook is only the add-on on that, that, that phenomena I think that that should be highlighted uh, clearly thank you thank you very much very good Interesting. Other comments on the or from the panel or from the audience on this on this aspect of the of the of the social media in emergency situation or from remote maybe Izumi is there yep. anything? Yes, there's one from uh, the remote participant. Uh, can you read that? Uh, the question is how to protect internet users against cyber crime and still allow freedom of access. Uh, his name is Rudy Vansnik. Okay, very good, a very good question. Anyone in particular from the panel would like to start? Um, okay, uh, uh, Patrick, I'm sorry, you go first. No, no problem, Tomas. I figured you'd probably call on me. How did you know that? He's from Belgium. 
I would say that you know this is obviously one of the one of the hardest questions. I mean, cybercrime is is something that affects you know users all around the world. Passing new laws is certainly one way to approach it, but we're finding that one of the most critical things, one of the most critical keys to user protection on the internet is education of users, for users about how to use the internet in a safe way. Now companies like Google play a role in that. I mentioned earlier the two-factor authentication that we have. Uh, that's a technology that we developed and so we have a you know, a, a certainly play a role in, in, in developing new technologies that protect consumers, but at the same time, it's, there's a non-trivial task in helping teach users how to use that technology and how to be safe on the internet, um, right? I mean, it, was, it wasn't that long ago that you know, most all of us had, uh, you know, as our password, the word password or the, you know, numbers one, two, three, four, right? And now that's gotten a lot better by teaching users how to use strong passwords in order to protect themselves and also for companies not allowing users to put in very simple passwords and so there's a you know there's a give and take that's part of the the uh, the answer for for protecting for protecting people from cybercrime it certainly isn't all of it but it's a but it's a very important part of it and to the extent that that users do feel more comfortable and safer online using the internet um, while well, there's a direct correlation between their ability to share and receive information online and their comfort level in using the internet as a platform uh, to, to share and, and, and exchange information that itself is, is in many ways what freedom of expression is. Very good, and I absolutely support that point. And uh, when it comes to children in particular, education of parents is absolutely essential because here we see a kind of generation divide between the kids who are um, um, tech savvy, basically, and the parents who might not be, which raise a number of issues on how uh, um, um, teenagers and even younger kids do use the, in the internet, let's say, while their parents don't even know what they are doing. Um, Sabine, you have a comment on that. I absolutely support the question of the need for more education and information for people on the internet. But one thing must also be clear. Uh, Cybercrime and illegal content is illegal. And it's, it's illegal in the real world and it's illegal also on the internet. And we have laws that are uh, uh, um, valu uh, valuable for law enforcement and that, but we have new, via the new technology, via the multi multimedia platform internet, we have other challenges for enforce the existing law, the existing consumer protection. Um, for example, the European Commission has an e-commerce uh, directive uh, that should help to enforce the protection of consumers on the internet, but it never will hinder people to do illegal things. Like we don't have it in in the in the real world. You never will protect people from from from uh, uh, being being um, confronted with illegal uh, content or cybercrime because uh, you ever you will ever have people who don't respect existing law. But the question uh, that uh, comes to the question of um, uh, freedom of speech and freedom of information and all the questions that are combined with it is with which instruments you make law enforcement, existing law enforcement on the internet. And there are several approaches in several countries that are very different. Uh, one say uh, there should be no uh, thing at all to, to control the internet or to do something. But sometimes I say in special cases we need controlling. Let's say for child protection, we need a controlling. We need a f not not a filtering system, yeah, but but a search system so that we can find illegal content. But we don't need the blocking. We need to to to to to um, delete it at the source. There are some questions we have to to deal with. Um, in, in the question of, of uh, combating cybercrime and combating illegal content, but we must be very careful to respect also the freedom of information and the freedom of speech, and we, find, we have to find a balance. It's, it's a very difficult way to find the balance, but we need to do, because on the one hand we have the fundamental right of, uh, of, of persons to not to be heard, on the other hand we have the right of freedom of uh, what to do and to take your own decision what to do and what to do not. 
uh, even if it's illegal, but you also have to take the consequences of illegal behavior. Thank you. I think this whole question of offline and online application of rule of law is clearly an emerging issue going forward. But I think we have a comment uh, from our, our friend from Indonesia as well. Hello. Uh, this is uh, Faisal Hassan from uh, ISOC Bangladesh. I'm one of the ISOC ambassadors as well. Uh, is My question is about uh, the freedom of expression. Is uh, hate speech covered under uh, freedom of expression? If not, then uh, that does global companies have any uh, role in protecting hate speech? Thank you. Thank you. And let's take a second comment then, please. Uh, sorry. Uh, hello, my name is Sita from Hivos. Uh, I would like to ask Sabine on the questions of the uh, balancing between fundamental rights uh, and how to protect. Uh, it, I agree totally with the, the terms of education, but how we talk to the government when the government think of if something happened in a pornography, for example, in Indonesia, then just filter or blocking. That will be, uh, and how we, we should communicate with the government to be able to manage the balance. Can you share an experience of a country about that? Thank you. So we will, we will start with Sabine on, since you pointed to her, and then we will come back to the uh, hate speech question from our colleague uh, from Bangladesh. Thank you. Uh, for example, I, I'd make a very concrete example from Germany. We um, have systems, we have, uh, for example, organizations like White IT and others who have, um, yeah, let's say, a combined approach between police, between companies, between uh, uh, NGOs who try to, to, to have a common approach and to help. First is the education, the information, but also to find out where you have uh, where, you, where are these uh, pictures on the internet. That's the reason why they collect hashtags to filter uh, from, from, from, from, from special computers or content where there is a, um, yeah, let's say, where, where you, you think there is illegal content there and you have um, a, a basis uh, on which you, you can, you can uh, it's difficult for me in German, in, in English, um, where the, the situation where you where you think there might be illegal content, they have the possibility to filter and to take a look, a special look, um, and then if there are pictures of illegal content, child pornography, they are deleted, and uh, the the cases are brought to court. Uh, nothing can happen without having um, uh, uh, court decisions. Also, the filtering has to, to be done with court decisions, and that's very important that we that we have uh, legal, clear uh, systems and, and, and a frame uh, where where this uh, might happen. But without filtering, without having the opportunities also to take a look what's going on there, we have it in real life, and we also need it in the internet. But that should not tackle the freedom of speech and and to to to open up your own mind and, and to do something that's legal. Uh, that should never be touched. But I think uh, we also have to protect children, uh, especially with uh, systems, but not the blocking is the solution, because everyone who knows about the techniques knows that uh, each block can be uh, uh, turned around and that you can, can enter the pages also then. And with the blocking you never will uh, get the peer-to-peer -peer networks and all these pages where, where most of this content is found. And so um, I think uh, we need intelligent systems that work together. We need exchange also between the different uh, uh, um, agencies uh, all over the world, not just uh, all over Europe, but also cooperation between the police uh, everywhere to find uh, the, the right sites and to, to delete the illegal content, the, the child uh, pornography content uh, at the basis, at the source. Thank you. I, I would just add from my own experience before going to the hate speech question that the, the whole point about legal clarity, legal certainty is very important for business in general. I mean, all businesses, big, small, medium, everywhere, because, of course, child pornography is a very specific case. But in general, when it comes to those new business models online, knowing what we can do, what we cannot do, and where and when is extremely important. So that's also a call to policymakers around the world to make our life as easy as possible. Hate speech, who wants to, to go? Uh, no, I mean, I, I, I cannot ask Patrick again. Um, um, that would be unfair. Um, Ambassador Vevier, may I call upon you? And I'm, I apologize about yes, that. I'd be happy to uh, try to address it. And of course, it can be no accident that um, 
uh, one would ask a U.S. citizen about hate speech because uh, our First Amendment uh, to our Constitution basically indicates that almost all speech, there are some very limited exceptions, but almost all speech is to be tolerated. So in the United States, um, we accept uh, uh, and permit speech that in many parts of the world would be prohibited because of the, uh, the uh, nature of the uh, nature of the speech. Now, um, this this all relates uh, to a very interesting and important initiative that uh, Secretary Clinton of the State Department uh, has uh, sponsored involving internet freedom, involving the proposition that we want to make the internet as open as possible, that we want to encourage um, openness all over the world. Uh, and uh, this um, this general recommendation is one that um, requires us to acknowledge, however, that because of our First Amendment, we start with respect to content issues in a somewhat different place than, than many, many uh, other uh, societies uh, happen, to, uh, happen to do. Uh, there's one perhaps uh, generic point, however, that's, that's very important here and perhaps very useful. And that is, um, when we're trying to deal with matters of content, legal process is very important. It's important to have uh, well-defined legal processes. It's important uh, to have autonomous judiciaries or autonomous arbiters uh, who can uh, make decisions that will be respected, will be regarded as reliable. And uh, from, that, from that point of view, um, again, recognizing that um, in some countries, for reasons that are uh, entirely satisfactory from the standpoint of their individual cultures, there are going to be some kinds of expressions that will be regarded as uh, so offensive as to be uh, as to be prohibited, as to be sanctioned uh, at the outset. Uh, you you want to be as confident as possible where you encounter that uh, that the legal processes, the rule of law, uh, is very very carefully uh, observed. Thank you, Ambassador. Anybody else on the panel on this very important question? And, and no, Patrick, I'm not pointing at you. Okay, Giacomo? Uh, talking of another world, I can say what we do in, for this very sensitive topic in the broadcasting area when we come to the online, so the cross point between the two worlds. Um, uh, there is a, a thick um, guidelines book uh, that is provided by BBC to the people dealing with the uh, social network and the online application of the BBC uh, that is now more or less adopted by most of the broadcasters in Europe uh, and um, says that when you um, associate the contents of the broadcasters to the online world, for instance, uh, creating a, a group of interests or chats, etc., etc. This cannot be done without having a permanent uh, webmaster uh, that uh, is always present in the room uh, until the um, uh, is possible to post comments or uh, chat. The chat is um, active. In, uh, and in case of um, hate speech, that um, according to U UK regulation means uh, a racist um, comment uh, and other kind of. Uh, um, incitation that are not permitted by the law, then they are allowed to immediately isolate this kind of um, uh, intervention on, on the chat and to stop and to prevent the person to participate to, to the chat. Uh, of course this change again country by country, for instance uh, the, the negation of the uh, Holocaust in some countries in Europe is forbidden, in others is tolerated, so we don't have um, uh, a, a measure that applies all over the country in the same in the same way. Thank you, Giacomo. Um, I'm going to call upon my the two other co the two other. Uh, sorry, co. You want to add something, please? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, yeah, since I haven't had a chance to speak much for uh, today, um, just want to add on the issue of hate speech. 
Um, I would um, draw a difference between um, the, the simple existence of a content on the web and content that exists on a, uh, a private platform. So uh, in terms of uh, pure, pure existence of content on the web, uh, I believe um, as a Japanese citizen, uh, we have the same constitution, uh, not the same constitution, but uh, the same article um, as in the United States, which completely uh, protects the freedom of speech. So um, I believe that um, content should be allowed to exist um, on, the, on the web. Um, there should be minimal regulation but when you're talking about private platform, um, content that exists on services that are on a uh, certain company's platform, for example, certain social media, certain community services, these communities all have community content policies. Um, and uh, it is dependent upon these content communities' policies, which uh, content is allowed and which is not. So. Uh, and companies who provide these services would like consumers or users to have an enjoyable and productive experience. So uh, sometimes these rules are allowed and uh, sometimes they go above the law. Um, so uh, for example, uh, we do not permit hate speech on YouTube. YouTube has a community guideline um, and there are certain uh, the contents that get flagged and um, sometimes taken down. So uh, I would just draw that um, difference between a service and existence on the web. Thank you, Ko. I think Sabine wants to add something here. I just want to ask a question. Uh, if you now have on the web a group of uh, uh, neo-nationalistic uh, uh, persons making together a common guideline for their uh, blog or for their thing, is that freedom of speech if you tackle the freedom, the respect and the non-discrimination of other people? There are fundamental rights standing against each other. There are fundamental rights of each person and I think uh, you always have a border between uh, the right on the one hand and the right of the of the other person on the other hand the freedom uh, of your own rights can just go as far as you don't tackle the freedom of the other person and I think uh, in this respect we have to find solutions um, uh, for, for, for, for questions like hate speech and that is why in some uh, uh, countries or in some communities you have these common rules these common uh, behavior uh, uh, uh, because you say this is not what we accept in our society, in our community, in our platform. Uh, and it, it's not uh, uh, binding your freedom of speech uh, uh, because uh, the freedom of your speech can just reach as long as you don't tackle the fundamental rights of another person. Thank you, Sabine. I think we have a remote comment, remote participation comment. Can you please read it out? Uh, another question from the Rudy Vansnik, he's from Belgium. Uh, he says that due to the lack of conformity in the voice data, the problem of tackling cybercrime is very, very difficult. So what could be done from regulatory side in order to ob oblige the control of the voice data? Okay, thank you. So um, any... Anybody wants to start with that one, knowing that the question targets <laughs> regulators and I happen to have one next to me? <laughs> Sabine, are you okay with that? Yeah, I, I, just, I just talked about the e-commerce directive, for example, as uh, a kind of safe harbor or not. Let's say uh, internet intermediaries are playing an important role in these questions today in the context of free flow, free flow of information, access to information and the respect of human rights. Um, there are very various rights uh, uh, and um, you also have illegal content. Um, online intermediate liability has become increasingly controversial in uh, relation to, for example, copyright material, but also in other uh, um, cybercrime ac activities. Um, some countries um, have uh, give a special role to the internet intermediaries, such as internet providers or online marketplaces. And under certain conditions, 
uh, conditions. Uh, they are liable for the content uh, that their subscribers or even other internet users put online via their service. Uh, that's uh, the one way it is done. In Europe, the uh, prevalent model of ISP liability for third-party content is knowledge-based. Apart from the duty to remo remove expeditiously illegal content that they know of, there are few duties of care resting on hosting intermediaries. So in, in this directive um, that's very clear um, where are uh, responsibilities and where not. The directive on e-commerce forbids, for example, general monitoring duties. The directive does leave room for the creation um, of specific monitoring duties, for example, possibly monitoring duties that may be compatible with the directive are uh, an intermediate voluntary monitor for certain illegal content like phishing pages or something like that. Uh, and uh, the intermediaries falls outside uh, the scope of application of the directive because it does not act as a service provider as such. For example, a service provider that also acts as an editor on a forum cannot avail itself uh, of the exemption. Um, so we try to, to with the e-commerce directive to, to include also the service providers into um, yeah, the, the, the, the protection of consumers on the one hand, because uh, if you uh, have trust into a special service that's offered to you, uh, this service must be, yeah, let's say, legal and uh, safe for you to use. And that's the reason why uh, um, sometimes intermediaries become gatekeepers and have a special um, uh, responsibility on what they do and what they not do. But they are not always responsible for the whole content that's on their sites and all the offers that is, that is provided there. If you have an offer on eBay and uh, you don't f uh, get the right, the right product you ordered, uh, it's not the responsibility of eBay, but I think it's, it's a responsibility of eBay to put these uh, offer out of, of the service. Because if you, if you use such a provider, uh, such a service provider, you, you want to, um, to be sure that it's, that it's uh, a legal offer and that it's clear. And uh, um, I think we, we have to do many things on that, but uh, also to include in a special, in a specific way, the intermediaries is very important. You, uh, thank you, Sabine, for this very comprehensive answer from the European angle. Uh, unless anyone from the panel wants to comment on that point, uh, and because time is, uh, is going very fast, we, we, we are going now uh, to uh, uh, wrap up the session. So, uh, last chance for a question from the audience or, from some, or a point from somebody on the panel. Uh, no, then I will pass the floor to my two co-moderators. Uh, uh, Anna, you want to go first maybe, and then uh, Izumi? Thank you very much. So it is our very first day of uh, the I IGF. I think that we are still warming up, but uh, our our speakers were very good. Very well, they they were excellent, and I I would like to thank them very much because I think that we had a very good discussion. Um, so th this is the emerging issues discussion. So I, I incentive everybody to continue this uh, discussion in the workshops uh, that will follow uh, in the in the in the next days. Uh, and now I just want uh, I just would like to emphasize or, or to underline uh, the, the the main ideas or the main words that I think that I heard. Uh, here today from uh, from this discussion, so that the global challenges deserve wide range of solutions. Um, we didn't have um, a very good discussion about freedom of expression, but a little bit of hate speech. Uh, we discussed net neutrality and its importance. The, access, the accessibility of the internet to everybody. Uh, I think that we had a very good discussion about uh, the traditional media versus internet and the regulation problems. So, too many questions still to be answered and day by day my, more questions will come up. And therefore, that's why these fora at the multi-stakeholder model are so important. Thank you.
Thank you. And Izumi, uh, up to you. But just before that, I just want to take up one point, uh, which is what Anna just said. You just mentioned because, yes, it was reflected into the discussion, like old media versus new media. I think here there is there is it's all media and new media it's it's it's all media actually that are going to to benefit and are benefiting from this this incessant revolution and it's up to us collectively to put in place the right the right framework uh, civil society business policy makers ngos me and journalists as well so it is it is our job to make that you know new world happen in a, and that everybody can benefit and then citizens consumers can benefit from a you know a rich and safe online experience but izumi thank you thomas um well to remember we started with the internet or the role of the internet based services and also that of the traditional media during and after the crisis or disaster um areas or hours and days and months Well, first, it's my, my personal comment that the disaster thing in Japan hasn't really recovered much at all. People were moved to the, some of the temporary houses, more than 100,000 people were, are there. And beyond that, many citizens around the nuclear power plant has no hope to return in coming 30 or 50 years. And also the industry, especially the local industry, the SMEs, were heavily destroyed and there are very few jobs. You may think that Japan is one of the developed countries and with, with some economic powers. Yes, we do have, but it's not really there in the, some of the devastated areas and people. And can ICT or Internet do something better for them? We are working on, but um, perhaps from those pe citizens in the devastated areas viewpoint, it's far less uh, sufficient yet. Um, however, as I mentioned in the beginning, that some of the experiences we learned from the disaster um, experiences, I mean, there are certain lessons of post-mortem as um, co described, that we are finding some new ways of using so-called big data. Uh, we, I was part of the workshop uh, of about six weeks long, and we were offered whole tweets of the week after uh, March 11 from Twitter. Um, a lot of information about Google's search, as well as the TV broadcasters, the national uh, NHK, the almost something similar to BBC, also provided a one-day full text. And the newspaper company, uh, Asahi, also provided one week text of whole news, not only about the crisis, but old news in text. And then the, the probed data from the, the, the traffic, uh, driving traffic cars and other you know, interesting material. And you can, being a open data, you can mash it up the way you like and uh, you can animate them, you can sort of reproduce them. The only thing I do regret is these, these had there been measures, say, ready when the earthquake hit us, not 18 months after. And that, technically speaking, if you have the will, and we can do that uh, for the next one, you never know when it's going to come to where. Um, but also, there are certain exceptions of um, constraints of the use of the personal data. In certain areas, has been removed. In other areas, they didn't, um, by the authority or others. Um, we have some observed some uh, use of the public data and they share that beyond the copyright or other regulatory uh, constraints, um, broadcast linked with the internet. And these are many examples that um, not only in Japan perhaps but in the Christchurch cases and other cases we may see all these emerging new use of combination of traditional and new media. We don't, as I said, the, the victims didn't care if it's digital or analog. They, they care about their lives. They care about the information they need or the way that they want to express their 
uh, state. Um, I'm getting a bit too long, so I, I may wind up one more word. Because this is emerging issues that I'd like to just bring up one area uh, following your fantastic phrase of the regulation is a crystallization of the civilization. Okay, how many people know about the 3D printers and the regulation over that? Not too many. Uh, combined with open source, you can share any design of a product, material, or artifact online and use this 3D printer or laser cutter or other digital um, machines. You can create your weapon, you can create your medicine perhaps, in the years to come. It's called Fab Lab or Fab Life, F A B L I F E or Fab Lab. It's a big movement over the horizon, especially in, in Europe. There's certain movements in Japan, Indonesia, India. Certain developing country folks have finding the sort of shortcut not to rely on the mass production, which are usually coming from the north. And combined with this interesting sharing of the knowledge and experiences in the digital format that allows you to create something tangible and real. And it's opening up a new, real, interesting world that whether it falls within the internet governance, multi-stakeholder, we don't know, but it's highly likely. That's my end of uh, my sort of observation. Giacomo, you uh, want to add a word? No, I'm scared. This will concern also spaghetti. Yeah, because I'm against it. Of we, course. We, the the, you the can create the pasta machine, first of all, the way you like. Seriously. Well, uh, uh, as long as it doesn't concern French cheese, because it's my uh, home country, I'm fine then. Uh, I just want to, uh, on, on the behalf of my two colleagues here, uh, thanks again all the panelists. We were very lucky. It was multi-stakeholder here. We had, we had one elected official, we had one ambassador, we had business, we had NGO. Schengen, thanks for being here. Thanks to all of you. Thanks to remote participation. Um, and yes, we have a comment. Yes. Yes, we have a question. Uh, we have a question from a uh, remote participant, uh, his name is, he is from Bangladesh, from ISOC, his name is Dhaka Chapter. The question is, anti-religious contents in social networks are creating social unrest around the world, but large corporations like Google, Facebook are not ready to remove this content in the name of the freedom of expression. This leads to blocking of the websites. What is the solution to this situation? Okay, so that would be really the last... That would be really the last uh, question because we are we run out, run out of time. Anybody in particular uh, wants to tackle that one? I know it's a bit uh, it's a tough one. Uh, Izumi. Yeah, instead of Google speaking too much on behalf of you guys, um, because how many of you were there in the big tent yesterday last night? Um, Windsurf dealt with this question interestingly. They removed some of the real offensive content about the, some of the religious issues um, because they knew it may hurt more people violently, directly. So they, they went beyond the free speech sort of standard and t took it as a special case perhaps. But sometimes, like the disaster thing, I think it's a healthy move. Um, how to really, as Sabine said, uh, create a balance. And there's no silver bullet, but I think cases like this will indicate how to move. Of course, the civil society will make further noise, but let's take it aside. Thank you. Okay, and I think the last word from, will be from our chairman, Ambassador Vivier. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, it's been a pleasure uh, to chair this afternoon's session uh, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your comments and for your contributions. Uh, Anna, Azumi, Thomas, uh, thank you for keeping the session moving along so smoothly. And Valeria, we thank you for bringing in the comments from our uh, remote uh, participants. And of course, I want to thank the panelists uh, for their contributions. Uh, I think it's fair to say that this session has been a great success. Uh, with these comments, I'd like again to thank uh, all concerned I call the session closed and pass the microphone to Mr. Masango for the, of the IGF Secretariat. Thank you very much, Ambassador Vivian. Um, yes, as the Chair said, um, 
that's it. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow. There are buses out front um, to go to the dinner. And I just have a small announcement to make. Somebody has lost a wallet, which is a white, pink and red with a Arabic calligraphy on it. It's cloth with um, Egyptian pounds and some cards. If nobody's found it, can you please hand it over to the um, security? Thank you.